Brendan Sweeney here. This is another episode of Finding the Frame. We have the amazing cinematographer, Matthew Chung here. How's it going? Good, good, good. Thank you very much for having me. We really appreciate hey. you guys bringing me in and having to talk about it is amazing to have you. It was a pleasure getting to watch your movies the last couple of weeks. I've spent going through your whole catalog on your website. I got to watch You Won't Be Alone, Blue Bayou, also you, Kenzo, the uh, Yo My Saint mm -hmm. uh, short film that you did. We have a lot to talk about, but it's super awesome to have you at Filmmakers Academy to go through this. And uh, yeah, what's what's new with you? What's been going on these days? Um, just being back in LA, uh, I just did a film with Garen Stoblesky, the our second film after You Won't Be Alone. Um, so uh, we wrapped that in Melbourne just before Christmas. So I've come back to LA and just been here for uh, since now and just looking at what could be the next adventure. How are you feeling with every, like the whole pandemic coming to a close, hopefully, and the industry opening it up? It seems like a lot of people are super busy. Yeah, no, it seems like, you know, hopefully everything comes back and, you know, hopefully everyone's... You know, we've obviously had been through quite a lot and, you know, maybe we come back with a certain like, I don't know, extra, I don't know, some kind of. Yeah. Well, I feel like times like energy this, or something like that. Yeah. I feel like times like this, especially when everyone gets shaken up, you know, mm -hmm. we were so used to a certain reality that we were living in. And mm -hmm. I feel like this is where art, art really births. And a lot of these, mm -hmm. you know artists that were going through this time. I'm really excited to see what films come out on the other end. I feel mm. like there's going to be a new voice to cinema and I'm super stoked about that. So to paint the picture of you, Matthew, I would love to talk about your childhood. You were just telling me mm -hmm. that you were born in Taiwan mm -hmm. and at a young age, you moved to Australia, which is super fascinating. And uh, just Australia itself, that's such a great film industry. A lot of mm -hmm. great filmmakers come out of their movies. What was it like for you as a young artist did you know you wanted to be a filmmaker at a young age no <laughs> yeah no. um obviously i loved films um grew up watching you know uh, star wars uh indiana jones jackie chan films you know jurassic park i remember like really loving that and then spending time at the video store and then starting to go in all the different sections and starting to look at Wong Kar Wai and like a lot of like foreign cinema and uh, La Haine, you know, I was like, oh, what are these kind of films? And I was learning about cinema, the craft of it, um, and obviously learning a lot about what happens outside of the world. And, you know, my parents, you know, they worked in a restaurant. So I didn't even know you could do filmmaking as a profession um and i didn't quite get the marks to get into university at the time for anything like design or architecture or anything like that because i was too busy watching movies and then at one point my dad was like hey what do you want to go to like a small film school and it wasn't like anything prestigious like a private college kind of thing like a technical college and i was just like oh i didn't know i could do that um and I guess, yeah, it started to go from there. And then... Uh, and at what age was that when you decided, okay, I want to be... I was like 17, mm -hmm. out of high school. And do a lot of people, is that something... Is there, you know, in the United States, a lot of the big universities, they have film schools or at least some type mm -hmm. of film theory program. Is that typical in Australia? There's like two places. There was afters, which was very, very prestigious at the time. Um, some of our greatest filmmakers have gone through that. And uh, there was another place in Melbourne, uh, VCA, mm -hmm. where a lot of our contemporary Australian filmmakers went through. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and I didn't try to get in either of them at the time. Mm -hmm. But also, you know, I just went to like a small private college, like technical college, which to be honest, doesn't exist anymore. And I was what, 2001? 2002 so it was still kind of like 16 mil film um dv you know the 5d hadn't come out yet mm -hmm. uh the red hadn't come out yet either so yeah we were just 16 mil was our uh our, i guess our final year projects or our prestigious projects 
And as you were going through, you know, you said you spend a lot of time watching movies. I mean, Lahane, that's one of my favorite mm-hmm. movies as mm-hmm. well. Very, very solid film. Mm-hmm. And uh, I guess you went into film school. And did, was there a certain moment that you knew you wanted to be a cinematographer? Did you go in knowing exactly that's the role that you wanted to play in the bigger picture of filmmaking? I think a lot of people maybe, I don't know if it's changed, but back then, I think mean, everyone wanted to be a director. Mm-hmm. Um, I did direct a bit, but I did find myself being drawn towards the visuals I did quite a lot. Um, yeah, I was just really excited with like moving the camera and lighting and, you know, trying to figure that out and, you know, trying to be maybe a bit cool back then. But that's something that uh, I feel like I had a good feel for. Mm-hmm. Uh I guess my gut instincts seem to be on the visual side of things. Uh, looking back, maybe I should have looked into more working with actors more <laughs> as a director. But um, yeah, that was kind of like something that I was looking at. And then, you know, I did direct a little bit. I was directing and shooting, you know, because when you're starting out, no one's giving you work yet. So you're still trying to find yourself. And you're still just trying to like build work up. You know, go out and shoot short films and music videos and, you know, whatever you can kind of do. And at the time, I was uh, directing and shooting because a lot of people at the film school that I had gone to, a lot of them kind of moved overseas. There were a lot of them from around the world. A close friend of mine, Jacob, is from Sweden. And him and I, we really clicked. And, you know, we still work now. Like, uh, you know, I did quite a lot of commercials with him in, uh, in and around Europe and Sweden and Denmark and um, New Zealand. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, no, it's really great that we, you know, are still kind of doing that. We haven't done it for a couple of years recently, mm-hmm. but yeah, we, I mean, we're on the phone. Like, and- I got constantly so once you got out of film school what was the big next step for you did you have a project that really started to push you in the door of filmmaking as a cinematographer at least in australia what was the first big project that at least wedged your foot in there so i i I was in film school pretty young i think i started when i was like 17 just turning 18 so when i graduated i was like what 20 so i was really young um and myself and a group of friends at the time in Sydney, we ended up buying like a HVX, Panasonic HVX. Mm-hmm. Is that what it is? A, with P2 cards? Yeah, yeah, with yeah. the P2. And yeah. then, you know, we decided to just make it this film, like this action film, kind of like a Heat ripoff. A Heat and Miami Vice ripoff, but in Sydney. And, you know, we started shooting this film on weekends. It's running around and... Um, it was like a small group. It was maybe, you know, bounce between four to six people. Um, and it would just like try different things. I would just shoot scenes every weekend. And after th- there's like two years, maybe we finished, we had a finished film. Um, it's not a great film, but I think we, you know, we definitely learned a lot on that film. What, what, uh what spoke to us and also our like my ego was broken down very very quickly <laughs> because i realized i don't know what i'm doing especially when it came to like directing actors mm-hmm. but you know we were shooting some kind of cool things and you know we shot in like a uh uh, uh disused prison um you know there's some pretty big set pieces and I think it might be on Amazon Prime oh, wow. now, like yeah. it's Braille. It's not a great film. Well, people are going to be looking for it It's not a great film, now. but like I said, I went through the paces on that film. And, you know, I think we end up making it for like $40,000. That's pretty good. Total. And it's a feature film. Yeah, it's a feature film. Um, it definitely has a lot of... And it, if I watch it now, I'll probably cringe. But, <laughs> you know, that was like the small thing. And, it, you know, it never really went anywhere. But at the same time, you know, I, I think... It was almost like it was your baptism by fire mode. Yeah, it was which that. I think, yeah. And then, then I started working on 
music videos, like proper, well, I wouldn't say, you know, like from $2,000 to all of a sudden we're doing 5,000, then a 10,000, then mm -hmm. like a $40,000 music video. And then, then I moved to Melbourne and in, in Melbourne, I started, I, I worked with a producer who had seen what I had done, respect that I made this really bad film, but he was like, oh, I can see like, there's like something going on with you and you're, you know, you're, 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 you're not afraid to give things a chance or to try things out and fail, but at least you're pushing. And he managed to get me into some more commercial work, which I was both directing and shooting and also shooting for other directors. Um, and then I had a pretty good run doing some decent commercials in Australia. And then, you know, I was starting to make money for the first time. Like I, I was, I think I was, before I moved to Melbourne, I was like still living at home. And what was the time frame for that? How old were you? Uh, maybe 25, 26. So I was living at home like for a while, mm -hmm. which is like not great for your self-confidence. <laughs> <laughs> but which is why I was, I, I have to leave. I have to go move to Melbourne. I have to like mm -hmm. do something with and then to like, just to like, you know, I was like unemployed for like a long time. You know, when I moved to Melbourne, I didn't really know anyone. To be honest, I think I followed a girl that I met in Japan. <laughs> <laughs> I met this girl on a train station, like randomly. She was Australian, she was from Melbourne. And you know, we hung out and I was like, oh wow, like she's incredible and I kind of want to like, and she, she, just, she wasn't interested. I kind of built that up in my head. But then she said something in like the letter rejecting me which was kind of interesting like you know she's like yeah you're great but all these guys but then she wrote a line in there she was like oh you seem to be like the kind of person who goes for what they're after and i remember reading that line i was like well i don't think i am that person and then i started thinking i was like fuck maybe i should just i should start being that and ever since you know i moved them out it didn't obviously nothing happened but it was a it was the best choice I had made at that time is because it kind of put me outside of my comfort zone and I started working with people who gave me a chance but they could also see um, that you know I'm not here to just mess around like uh, you know uh, working in a way that um, yeah, there's thought behind it and there's reasons why it's doing certain things and, you know, just following your gut instinct. Mm -hmm. um, That's really cool. It's almost like you had a formative moment that helped be the catalyst to really become the artist that you wanted to be. That's right. And ever since then, I always look back at that thinking, oh, you know, you can go against the grain or mm -hmm. confront some certain things. It's like you have choices. And if that particular time, you know, and nothing was really working, so... I felt like I need to like push myself more and put myself in an uncomfortable position or a position where I'm forced to like confront certain things and be open, mm -hmm. um, you know, and that was the same decision to move to LA. At that point I was doing commercials. I was making money for the first time, but the work itself wasn't quite personal. And it wasn't quite, and yeah, at the time, like Melbourne and Australia, it's a great film industry. It's very supportive, but it's also a small community. Mm -hmm. And to progress in the ranks of that, like, you know, like I said, I'd done some commercial work, but I couldn't get any narrative. I couldn't get any TV. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there was like a closed door that I felt. And, you know, the conversation, oh, well, he hasn't really done it, so we can't give him that. Mm -hmm. And then I'm like, okay, if that's a mentality that maybe I will, instead of fighting that, just find my own way in a different kind of place. And coming to the U.S. Was there anything that brought you out to Los Angeles or was this more of a leap of faith? Leap it was faith? a bit of a leap of faith. I had done some work, which had the attention of an agent here and he was like, yeah, yeah, I can't do anything with you in Australia. You're, you're, you're too far away. You should, you know, if you're serious about coming here, you, you have to come here. And, you know, I had a music video that I shot and directed called Fractures. Mm -hmm. um, 
uh, It's Alright, where we shot in Chernobyl. Oh, wow. And that was something that I was still in Melbourne at the time. A band had asked me to pitch an idea for a music video. There was a particular line in that music video where I, it's like Goodbye Future or something. Or something you know? And I was like, oh, wow, like from that idea or that line, I came up with, oh, maybe we should shoot in Chernobyl. It's like 2014, maybe 14, yeah, 14, 15, I think. And at the time, you know, they turned the music video down, but I just really loved it. I wanted to keep pushing this idea. And then a friend of mine who's a production designer, he had a great look and I was like, Hey, do you want to come to Chernobyl with me? Just the two of us will go and shoot this idea. And he was a very, uh, Hugh Marchant. So it's just the two of us, we went to, uh, Ukraine during the Ukraine revolution um, that had started just before uh, wow. we arrived well I, sorry yeah it started before we arrived it ended like within 24 hours of landing um, and we were walking around Kiev and obviously now with what's happening there it's mm -hmm. like it's yeah it's insane the, uh, yeah it's wild but somehow being in that and seeing what the Ukrainians were going through and you know, they have, as a community, they were very, uh, co uh, they were like emotionally connected with each other. Mm -hmm. And seeing that definitely changed the way we approached our filming in Chernobyl. Um, and hopefully we did it in a respectful way. Because, you know, that's obviously a very real thing that happened. Yeah, for sure. So, and then, you know, the concept of the film, uh, of the, we didn't know what it was, but the concept of that piece was a man returning to a place that he once knew and trying to recreate the, what life was mm -hmm. um, and what it could be. And you said you shot and directed this. Yeah. So it was just myself, Hugh, and our tour guide. And while you, it seemed like while you were in Australia until at least coming to Los Angeles, you were still doing a lot of directing? Uh, to be honest, the last year or so, I started shooting more. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I started shooting more. Yeah. And yeah, this was some of the, I just shot because I really like the idea. But coming to the US, I kind of was like, ah, oh, I kind of like just shooting. So this, this uh, short film that got you noticed more, the one that we were just talking mm -hmm. about. So you came out to Los Angeles and when was that? 15, 16, maybe? It's like mm -hmm. five, five years? Yeah. Uh, so maybe, uh, yeah, towards the end of 17. And then what started happening? Was it right away you felt like you were finding opportunities out here? How did you start stacking the cards? So I started working on commercials and music videos. Um, and it was just like, uh, obviously meeting a lot of filmmakers and, you know, just had a lot of, a lot more chances for people to give you a, a uh, project to be able to be mm -hmm. part of. And one of the big projects was the Kenzo You're My Saint with someone like Lily, who I had a lot of respect for before. And kind of when that came, I was like, how do I, uh, how do I be a part of this? Because, you know, Lily's a filmmaker of mm -hmm. uh, Go Walks Home is like one of my favorite films. Um, so being able to be like in consideration was one of the reasons why I came to the U.S. It's just the being in consideration for projects like this. And obviously it worked out and being able to work with Stan, uh, you know, to stand side by side with someone like Lily to be able there to support her with uh, this piece. It's mm -hmm. like it definitely um, built uh, confidence in what you're in, doing and you know with mm -hmm. someone like her and, and you know the way she likes to make her films and for the sure. way she pushes and and for something like kenzo yo my saint which just so everyone knows the director is anna lily amapur she's done uh the girl walks home at mm -hmm. night and the bad batch two remarkable films that i highly mm -hmm. recommend everybody watching when you go into a project like that knowing that this person's very good mm -hmm. what do, how do you prepare as a filmmaker for like say Ken's or even Blue Bayou or you won't be alone. Uh, what is the process that you like to do as a director of photography? 
Uh, that's a very good question. Um, it, I think it depends on the project and depends on the filmmaker. You know, someone like Lily, I had a lot of respect for. Someone like Justin Chan, who directed Blue Bay, I had a lot of respect for. Because you had seen what they were beginning to kind of do. And a lot of my, a lot of what I do now, I guess when I work with directors, is try to hear what they're all about. Um, their point of view as a director, filmmaker, person. And you know, the reasons why they're doing something and trying to like, uh, uh, this is building up. Um, I'm just trying to think how to describe it. Like building up how I can support them. Mm -hmm. um, and for something like Yo My Saint, what was, you know, as you started talking with Lily about how you want this project to mm -hmm. unfold, how do you work collaboratively to get the most out of what the vision was? Like, what did you want the audience to take away from that film specifically? I mean, then when that film, it came along, you know, Lily had worked with Karen O together. Karen O wrote this incredibly beautiful song. And uh, I guess it was like, I remember just seeing her at a, at a, at a like a, cafe and just talking ideas and what she was kind of like yeah you know, as she would say like her uh what turns her on when it comes to cinema mm -hmm. you know uh and you know but that particular thing was like this longing this lust you know having someone kind of like still kind of like stay within you even though they've moved on or time has passed so you know, we've all kind of like been through some mm -hmm. life experiences kind of like that. And, you know, just really there to just, yeah, be like just there to be supportive of mm -hmm. what Karen and Lily had kind of built up. And, and Yeah, and it's beautifully executed, especially in the last scene where it's uh, in the karaoke room and you see the juxtaposition mm -hmm. of the girl that I'm assuming that has left mm -hmm. this guy's life in the new girl. Mm -hmm. And it's almost this really beautiful of sometimes when you find someone else in your life, mm -hmm. you see a reflection of that past person yeah. in them. Yeah. Even as much as you want that past person to exist, there's, that person will never be them. Yeah. And that's, that's what I exactly thought was right, really, yeah. really beautiful of that piece. Like it was so simple, but you understood it. And obviously the Karen O song and the lyrics played into it very well. But the simplicity of the visuals and not having to cut around a lot too. Mm -hmm. I thought you mm -hmm. did a really good job of just figuring out compositions that told the story. Mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Here's the thing, like we are working with Lily, you know, at the particular time I hadn't done a lot of stuff that was like deeply personal to, for the filmmakers. And that was one where it was like Kenzo kind of just allowed Karen O and Lily to kind of do their own thing and they embraced that. But I remember like filming and then looking over at Lily and she's standing there by the monitor like very emotional or she's really into it and I was like oh like I love what she does as a filmmaker is because it's so personal to her and she is invested emotionally into this so it's she's gone by her feelings it's not overthought it's not too calculated it's just like her instincts and how she feels and to be honest they're the kind of filmmakers that I've you know, I've seen that and I, I guess the seed started to grow and then that evolved with Blue Bay with Justin and I, it evolved even further with You Won't Be Alone with Goran. Um, you know, and then, yeah, Lily was like one of the first filmmakers that you can feel what you're, what you're shooting. Mm -hmm. And I think she was calling it like a cinematic orgasm <laughs> you know like that seems she's like something that you know she like she's say, something sure. like you know she's like kind of punk and you know she's like oh yeah i just want to get turned on but what she was saying is like oh i get i get that because we're all feeling it and that's something that like i said going into projects and pushing even further now especially with Bubai, especially you won't be alone everything is really driven by how things feel mm -hmm. and that's from spending a lot of time with the director, the producers, the crew, and um, 
yeah, really just making the choices. I kind of like push for that. Or we're trying to find that. And it, when we all feel it, then it feels amazing. And it, that's kind of like reason why we do what we do is to always sure. search for that feeling. And, you know, it doesn't come on every project. And mm -hmm. certain projects that aren't designed in that kind of way, like a commercial, you know, like obviously you can feel that. And I have throughout the career of that. But when it comes to films, like it's, especially if it's, a very director writer driven mm -hmm. piece like it really you know there's a responsibility as well to whatever that you're working on and it could involve a real community um and i mean you won't be lying you can't you know that's like uh its own crazy reality that was created mm -hmm. but it's all driven by feeling and you know, I'm not someone who tries to overthink mm -hmm. or to be too calculated, but I'm open to try things and I'm open to like explore and... Do you ever do anything like, I know Terrence Malick and Lubezki when they shoot projects, they'll mm -hmm. create like a rules of engagement, right? Yep. Do you do anything like that when you're, I know it might be per project, but in terms of figuring out compositions per character, is yep. that something that you like to try um, to devise? So with starting with Blue Bayou, Justin likes things to be very free, and it's uh, you know he's always like, "Hey, we're we're making a film about people, making a film about people." So on that particular film, myself and Anti, who's out the DP, we would light the spaces and. We tried to keep keep the mechanics of filmmaking outside of what the actors were doing, so it's a very kind of free flowing, you know. Even though it was quite premeditated and designed, uh, we always had that mentality, like you know, if we lie, we're lying from real sources. You know, it's based on reality, but like slightly heightened. You know, we shot on sixteen mil, so we always approach things with you know, lighting from natural sources, windows, practicals, mm -hmm. stuff that's hidden. And on You Won't Be Alone, which is about a witch in 1800s Macedonia who has lived in a cave for 16 years, so she doesn't have any idea of how to behave around other people because she's been isolated. And then as a witch, she learns to shapeshift. It's like a crazy idea yeah. for a film. <laughs> but in our early conversations with Gora and the director, and writer, um, you know, we discussed like the ideas of this film was so crazy that for an audience to buy into it, it feels like it, we need to ground it to make it feel very, very real. And by doing that is to really support what the actors are doing was, um, you know, this mm -hmm. woman, this young girl is shape-shifting at a different, <laughs> I've, I've never seen like mm -hmm. uh, human behavior or body language kind of in that kind of way. So we agreed to support and to allow the actors to be able to do their thing. And back to you, what you were saying is, you know, like it wasn't initially planned to be as for the whole film, but we're like, all right, we'll s once again, I lie for the space. Uh, Bethany Ryan, the production designer, did an amazing job having uh, the world feel believable and very, very detailed. And so the actors were allowed like, sorry, not, uh, so we gave, Goran gave the actors the freedom to, if they feel to go, like, if they feel their instincts to go a certain way, to just keep going with that. Mm -hmm. And then Goran would sometimes would direct them and uh, direct me, but the actors were essentially allowed to do whatever they wanted mm -hmm. within the, you know, within what they discussed. And then if they felt like going a certain direction, then we would move in that certain direction. Right. It felt very much like the Dardeen brothers. I don't know if you watched yeah. the movies. So that's, yeah. yeah, yeah, you're right. And then, you know, Malik, you hear stories where they're like, the actors can kind of go outside and then, you know, he might mm -hmm. see something and then spontaneously move in that direction. And we wanted to have this, that, same um uh approach to be honest we yeah we started pushing more towards it because it started work like we as goran you know he knew what he needed for the scenes but he also wanted the actors to discover moments and 
for the camera to discover that and to not feel too you know we tried a few things where we had choreographed the blocking and the camera you know it was like we tried it and we both looked at it like oh i don't know like it kind of like it's starting to feel a bit kind of like too Mm. designed it kind of pulled you out a little bit whereas when we were like all right let's just try it let's just like what what we've been doing and i just felt more alive it felt more spontaneous and like like i said with those moments where you're like oh i just felt something there it was like quite constant mm-hmm. so and you know it's inc- incredibly intimidating and challenging and like for the crew for the focus puller for the boom operator to go to let's just say hey I, I don't quite know what we're doing but just be be, be prepared for anything <laughs> it's like it's daunting but we started to see collectively the reasons why we're doing it and we're sure. finding these moments that felt very very real and alive and it had the effect um that we're pushing for is like this feel was kind of real mm-hmm. um and so we started doing that more and more and um you know the actors really loved it um you know, we had a lot of non-actors a lot of animals a lot of children and then just allowing them uh, allowing them to just be immersed and to respond as opposed to telling them you know not clowning too much and like the the mechanics of filmmaking and the blocking and the you know and then I, the thing is obviously I'd follow with them but I I'd spent a lot of time before in pre-production with the red komodo mm-hmm. going through the spaces with my own set of cooks bee pancros I could see what the light was doing and then I was trying these uh compositional ideas that had gone when I would try. So we had done a lot of homework. So whenever the actor would move to a certain spot, I kind of knew where the light was working. So I would, I would move the camera and light from the position of the camera while still making sure we captured the performance, but also framing it in like a way that is quite abstract to what the performance is giving. You know, this film is really about this young witch and her feelings. It's very internalized. And through that, we're using like these longer lenses, like 40 mil to 75. Sometimes with the 75, with the diopter, because, you know, guy and wanted it quite close because it's very internalized, you know, like you, <laughs> you see in the film, it's very like her mind. It's very personal. So it made more sense to go longer lenses as opposed to like, I guess what Malik and Chivo have been done mm-hmm. doing recently, which is obviously incredible, but it's about that person within the space. <laughs> In the environment, whereas this is the person in her own inner thoughts and how she feels about a particular moment. Mm-hmm. Um, and once again, like this is kind of like stuff that we're like, I, could it work? I, I think so. We started trying some ideas out, and oh yeah, that feels right. Oh yeah, I'm liking how that is. Uh, oh, that feels a bit kind of off. Why is it off? So it's all based on that. And you know, these ideas were like. I remember going with the composition. I was like, I get this idea. I've never done it before with like putting someone on the bottom of frame because they feel like overwhelmed or small or unseen or they were trying to like hide from certain feelings. So we started with the Komodo and, you know, one of the actors, Sara, came on early in pre-production just to try out ideas. And it was great having her there, like having a because her and Guan would try out like the body language um, and the physicality of things. And then, you know, I would just shoot, shoot with it. And just once again, trying to search of what worked and what didn't. And then I remember Guan and coming up and say, hey, just like give her some more headroom. I was like, oh, okay, like, like this. And I was like, it was like, she was in the middle of the frame. He's like, no, 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 more. And then I was putting out the bottom of the frame. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> like, this is like, oh, I don't know. Uh, this is like, Against so tradition. unconventional. Yeah. But then I started piecing the images together in a sequence of images. And I could start, you know, this is just myself. And I could start to see, oh, it gives you a certain feeling. Oh, I can kind of see why this kind of starts working, you know? And then you're like, oh, yeah, I'm definitely feeling something here. I'm feeling a little bit, you know? 
but it's like on an isolated thing you're like oh this is like pretty pretty far out there you know is it too pretentious is it too like sure you know it's going to take an audience out but then you see it as a sequence of images you're like oh okay i think this could work at certain points mm -hmm. um, and i think that's important what you talk about with composition composition at least on its the like cinematography end of it mm -hmm. that is the vessel that you're putting the audience into mm -hmm. and a lot of people will think about just maybe moving the camera but it's okay what about the position of the elements that are within the frame mm -hmm. also having the actor move within the frame and that's why like Kurosawa was so great mm -hmm. because he would have a still frame but the actors would be essentially moving all about it was like a ballet and I know Michael Cimino one of my favorite mm -hmm. filmmakers he yep. did you know the deer hunter and then Heaven's Gate he always yeah, talked yeah. about like film is a ballet mm -hmm. and you need the actors to move within the frame as much as the camera needs to be moving as well mm -hmm. and that's what I loved about it especially like Blue Bayou, mm -hmm. the dynamic of the characters, especially the young girl, which is, uh, what's her name? Sydney, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Sydney Kowalski, who yeah, played yeah. Jessica LeBlanc. There's just a certain energy that you capture in these films. And something mm -hmm. I would love to talk a little bit more about is working with younger talent. Mm -hmm. You know, that's got to be a specific challenge. What is some insight into that? So I was with Justin when we were when he was casting so he would be casting and i, I was like hey matt come in and bring in camera you know especially with like these younger actors just to see how they felt with the camera with them and the presence of you know someone filming them and you know what's great about very young actors is because they're um so pure and they're uh uninhibited and you have to like support that you have to create the environment to support that so justin and i had spent a lot of time with sydney and her parents did an incredible job as well but the thing is with justin is that he had done a film with a child actor called gook uh prior with uh, uh that went to sundance and then you know i would ask him I was like how was your how, how did you like to work with actors in general but all, uh, obviously the child actor and then justin would say like because he's acting in the scene with them, he's directing them with his performance. So if he wanted them to go a certain way, he would behave a certain way and they will respond. So it's a very back and forth kind of thing. And we just have to be prepared camera wise. And that's something that we brought in with Blue Bayou is to try and once again, like, you know, Blue Bayou, it was a union production, we weren't sure on film, but we, every time we, was shooting we always tried to keep the size of it or the mechanics of it off from the actual particular room that we're shooting in and to really give justin the time with the actors and to give the actors um you know once again like that freedom or to be in a space that feels supportive and intimate um so yeah, that's the big thing with like mm -hmm. kids, uh, and you know, Blue Bay we had a lot of, a lot of non actors too, or actors or people that are very ingrained in New Orleans. And New Orleans is a very it's a character in that film, and you know we definitely spent some time there to get to know the people there and then embrace. They, you know they were very warm, and we wanted to uh, support that within the film and to really show a very distinctive character to New Orleans mm -hmm. and to embrace uh, the character and the textual quality visually, the weather is insane there. Yeah. <laughs> so we all wanted to represent that, the light. Um, yeah, so we wanted to rep capture that on film. And yeah, I feel like, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. Shooter on 16 definitely supported that. and. And I would love to talk about that a little bit more. And we'll specifically talk about Blue Bayou. Mm -hmm. Now, as a cinematographer, and I know that you were working with uh, Ante. Ante, yep. Ante. And what is the process that you like to go through with picking your tools? Do you spend a lot of time testing? And for this film specifically, so everyone knows, we'll just go through the breakdown. You used an Amira for digital, but then you also used an SR2 and a 416 to capture 16 millimeter. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like you shot with 250D also 500D and you did some ectochrome, mm -hmm. which is awesome. And you shot with the 16 super speeds in some Canon lenses. Yep. 
So, so Justin wanted to shoot on 16. It was like a medium and the types of films that he was really drawn towards. Texturally, it added something to what he's kind of pushing for. So he was fighting to shoot on film. And, you know, nowadays it's quite a cost to be able to do that, um, especially for, you know, a fairly small film like ours. And um, we had watched, obviously, a lot of films that were shot uh, on 16 mil in the 70s. Uh, John Cassavetes. I was going to say Cassavetes. Cassavetes. For sure. And once again, what that medium allowed him to do with uh, like the, all the characters in his films are all very alive. And we watched. Uh, some of the Mexican New Wave films, Amores Peros, uh, Beautiful, uh, Itumama Tambien. And we really liked how, once again, there were st- stories about people, people clashing, people being together. Um, and once again, like Mexico, all the places they shot those films was a very distinct character for that world. It was, you know, you can feel like you're a part of it. And that was like what we wanted to take from and to put that in Blue Bayou and make it our own thing as well, you know? It's obviously great to have these references, but we have to make sure these references are like the starting of an idea that we can start building on. Um, and, you know, with Blue Bayou, like we, most of it was shot 16 and we embraced what the size of that format, the cameras of that format. You know, I pitched to Justin a lot of like using zooms more. And then he was like, okay. And then I was like, yeah, a lot of like the films from the seventies, especially the films uh, mentioned before had a lot of zoom work. Mm-hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. But it wasn't just a visual thing. like. You know, the character of Antonio in the film, you learn that he was adopted from Korea from a very young age. Um, So he had a lot of internal struggles with who he was as a person through that experience. And um, so he's always self-doubting himself and is always in his head. And, you know, we we wanted to get into what that character was thinking. And, you know, the Zoom kind of came in on that um, quite a few times and it helped bring out what Justin was doing with his performance. Mm-hmm. So, you know, the thing with Justin is like, okay, pitch an idea, give me an idea, but there has to be a reason. And then, you know, if he thinks about it, he's like, nah, that's a bit too contrived or it's a bit too forced. But then he'll think about another idea. He's like, oh, yeah, no, I, okay, maybe I could do that in this scene as well. You know, like, he's always thinking about it. And there's a reason behind it sometimes it doesn't always have to be like spelled out mm-hmm. uh but yeah there's a reason by behind certain things and one of the things that i love the most about there was two things i really liked and i want to know if one was intentional or not mm-hmm. but one was the use of the super speeds and specifically the three blade aperture which made the bokeh look so nice uh that was pretty remarkable and then another one is I saw with some of the portions of the film where you shot film mm-hmm. that there was like in the gate there was buildup of dirt and stuff. <laughs> was that intentional? Added in post, or was that actually that that was not intentional, but embraced. Mm-hmm. So uh, being in New Orleans, the weather's crazy, the humidity is crazy. And then we started shooting and then we started seeing these hairs in the gate. We're like, okay, cool. Like we need to clean, you know, we did everything with the camera. The camera assist would always clean after every take, you know, and then we just started, we just keep getting, you know, we're pretty meticulous about it. And then we kept getting these hairs in the gate and we were speaking to the lab and trying to find out why we took the camera to Panavision. We cleaned it up multiple times. We just kept getting them. We're like, what's going on? And then, you know, Al Loder, who's very experienced, 
he worked on 12 years a slave you know it was like one of the last loaders around like well the last it was like we had this on every production like i don't know it's like the sh- shavings on the i don't know it's something to do with the weather yeah <laughs> we never really quite solved it even though it was like countless of emails and you know and to be honest watching the film like being in there and edit watching it i was like oh okay like it definitely has a certain feel it's tastefully done it's not something that's pr- like done a lot throughout the film mm-hmm. obviously it's not intentional but uh the moments that i saw it it wasn't overly punctuated i'm like oh you know that frames yeah, yeah, this yeah. image really nicely yeah yeah it's just I- yeah i mean it's just like i mean i was like oh, I, I really love it like you know and apparently the french love that it can <laughs> Mm-hmm. <laughs> with this screen apparently all the friends were like oh we love the hairs in the game because i thought they were going to clean it out i thought they were going to fix it in post but they decided to leave it which is great like it to me it just reminds me of like new orleans being in new orleans it kind of like yeah it's like i said the weather it was extremely hot and extremely cold and it would kind of beat you down but then you kind of embrace it and the people there are just so like resilient i don't know it just remind reminded me of just being in new orleans in what portions did you use the amira for then uh, the night motorbike heist mm-hmm. that was a predominantly on the mirror and some night stuff but and some like I wouldn't say it's second unit, but sometimes because our schedule is so tight, it was like 30 days, 30 and a half days in 58 locations. Sometimes we were shooting two units simultaneously, especially for the motorbike stuff. Like, Auntie would be with Justin on the process trailer with the, with the Sydney. They'll do that, and then Justin will come with me and with a stunt unit, and we would shoot... Re- Justin riding a motorbike so sometimes we had to like do that just to make our schedule work sometimes Auntie and Justin will be shooting one scene then I'll jump ahead to the next location start setting that up and then Justin will come over and we'll start shooting and then Auntie will jump on the next location sometimes we'll do that just because our schedule is so tight mm-hmm. most of the time we're together most of the time um, it was a single camera shoot um but yeah, the mirror, we had that for pre- predominantly one night scene because we were shooting on the street at night with motorbikes and stunt cars and stunts and we didn't have the resources to be able to light the whole street. Mm-hmm. So we shot that on the mirror predominantly. And something I would love to talk about, which you just went into there a little bit, is this was two DPs on one project, mm-hmm. which isn't traditional. Yep, yeah, 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 yeah. And I would love to, like, how was that process? So, anti... And Justin, they did two films, two great films. Both went to Sundance, Gook and Miss Purple. They're both quite small films. Um, and, you know, I had done one film, but it was like super small. And then Auntie was on Blue Bayou. Then he, you know, kept getting delayed. And so I came into the mix and then Justin and I were building it at one point. And through that process, they cast Alicia Vikander in the film and it just became a lot bigger than when I first came on. And, you know, the thing with Justin is like, we had spent quite a bit of time together and him and Auntie had made two films together. And for those of you who don't know, it's like Justin's the writer, director and the lead actor. And I think he was getting a bit I was like, oh, man, I have a lot on my plate. And this is like the biggest film that all three of us had done at that particular point. It jumped up considerably more. And, you know, I think he was like, oh, can I have the both of you? Because with Andy, he's had, you know, they've worked on their style together. But then I came in and I kind of added something new to the mix. And, you know, Justin was like, because I'm acting in it, I need the support of the both of you to be able to get through this. And, you know, we all believed in Justin, filmmaker, and what the film was saying. And, you know, I, we, Auntie and I had a conversation. It's like, hey, like, I don't know if this has really been done before. You know, like, a lot of our favorite films, like, like the Wong Kai Wai films, he has multiple DPs. A lot of people don't know. Like, in the movie, like, I think I had three DPs. It wasn't just... Uh, but it was, like, different yeah. because, he, you know, it was a little bit different because he shoots for so long. Sure. But for this, 
you know, like, you know, Justin's always down to try things a bit differently. And, you know, I thought about it, you know, and you're like, I, I kind of have to put my ego aside. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Auntie and I, we met and we're like, hey, if we're going to do this, we should really do this. Like, we should really team up. And, like, we stayed in the same Airbnb together and, you know, we made our choices together. And, you know, like, we were always on the same creative, like, taste of what we liked, you know, and obviously I'd seen the films that him and Justin had done. But like I said, like, I was, you know, the time I spent with Justin, I was pushing him, you know, I was presenting ideas that was like, oh, wow, I've never really, you know. So it was like we were building on what we were doing. And then Auntie and I both decided to do it. And we're like, hey, we have to do this. Like, we'll let's do it together. But also, there's two of us now. This film can't, we can't, it needs to be better than if one of us had shot it. You know, we made that pact, like all three of us were like, well, there's two of us. There's no excuse not for this to be a great film, but it has to be better than if just one of us had shot this film. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like I said, we started to realize, oh, this is like, there's, it, there's benefits in this if we're on the right page is to be able to, like I said, shoot two units at the same time and to be able to you know and it took a little bit getting used to but because our schedule was so tight like it was definitely beneficial and you know like yeah justin had so much on his plate that he could go f you know we he had the support right on yeah yeah that's levels. it and it seems like a very interesting challenge right like you said you had to set your ego aside and ultimately i mean i told you this before mm -hmm. we started rolling it's arguably one of the best looking films oh, of 2021. You. Thank you. In terms of comp, one of my favorite shots was, I think it's after the heist, mm -hmm. um, and he's on the bike, mm -hmm. and he like the camera's mm -hmm. locked on him, and we're mm -hmm. riding down the road, mm -hmm. and then he peels off. Yeah, I so that loved was loved that sense of movement. That was something that you know, like I said, we we're trying to get into his the main characters, like his psyche and what he's thinking up at the and what it like this internal struggles that he has and like i said i was like pitching the justin like, hey what about these zooms and we're like well what if we do the zoom on a while he's riding his motorbike because the motorbike is a timer is alone and he needs to make a choice here and then i was like well, what if you try this idea and he was like all right you know he thought about the reasons why and then, you know when we started shooting it like it was a stunt unit team and it was just myself on the camera we didn't have a focus pull because our focus pull was on the other unit so it was like pretty tight and it goes, it goes into like 140 or something like that. It was one of the, yeah, mm -hmm. the cannons, which is like 200. And it's one of the super speed zooms? No, it's a cannon zoom. Oh, okay. But yeah, in 16, it was like 120. So it was like in 35, that's like 200. Like it was like <laughs> trying to get the focus that long, but we're both on motorbikes. Like I'm on like a motorbike with like a tray mm -hmm. and he's riding, like he's acting and riding. So trying to get the hat, like, and then with a limited, like, road that we can get it every time or to reset, like, it was, yeah, pretty tight. <laughs> but it was something that we're all, you know, incredibly proud of because, yeah, it had a certain feeling to it. Like, it's not smooth at all, at all, but internally, yeah, yeah I think you just feel it, you know, and yeah. people are really kind of like invested in the character at that point, so... Yeah, yeah, the film it's, has it's a lot of, that we're very proud of. Yeah, it has a lot of texture, which I really liked. And now going into You Won't Be Alone, I would love to talk about a little bit more about the tools and why you went down that mm -hmm. route versus, you know, something that is a 19th century piece about mm -hmm. Macedonia. I feel like a lot of filmmakers would also really want to shoot on film. Now, was there a reason why? Was it just budgetary constraints? Did you always want to shoot it digitally? I would have loved to shoot on film, but I don't think and we're in Serbia. Mm -hmm. And we were like three hours out of Belgrade. We were like pretty out there. Yeah. <laughs> for that particular village. And I, uh, they didn't have like, the facilities for film at all. Mm -hmm. So it would have been trying to ship it to another country. And yeah, at that time, it was just not feasible. That said, though, I think because shooting on the Alexa Mini, you know, like I said, we had decided to be very free and allow the actors to be able to go with their instincts. So that means we creatively had to design our film gear uh, our our gear equipment to be able to be uh mobile and adjust and be efficient so you know it was just lexamine uh cooks pancros 
um, and a very minimal lighting package, mm -hmm. if if anything. Right. So we were very, very spontaneous. We designed that way, but it also had to be that way because we were on a mountain side like this. <laughs> like the village was around a mountain. So we were never on like le like flat land. <laughs> Even inside the rooms, everything, every room was on like a different level. So it's just like physically getting around was pretty tough. Mm -hmm. So we would try to keep things, you know, we brought what we needed. Um, once again, just to be able to move quickly. And then, you know, there were times where like, like even going to the bathroom was a hassle. <laughs> like the, the actual bathrooms that were provided, we ended up just going in the bush because it was quicker <laughs> just to go around, find a bush. And then, so Goran, one morning he went to pee and then he came back and was like, Matt, like the field is really, like there's a beautiful fog in that field. Let's go film. And we're like, cool, great. And then as soon as the crew heard that, like all of us just picked up what we needed and we went out and the actor came and we started shooting in this beautiful fog. And just to be spontaneous like that, to be able to be, you know, and Goran obviously knows what he wants at certain points. So, you know, we're pushing towards that kind of line. And, you know, that's where like the outcome of what, what we wanted was designed, you know, like it was all preconceived and designed mm -hmm. to be able to support that style of filmmaking. And why did you go with the one for four to one aspect ratio for that film? So that was something Goran short films he had shot in like one, th one, three, three. And he did a short film called Would You Look At Her, which won Sundance one year. And that was a Macedonian film. And he shot that one, three, three. So I had an idea of what he liked. Mm -hmm. And that was like a more of a Dardenne Brothers, like free flowing camera, but long lens, but not as much like it wasn't following the actors like we were kind of doing. But he liked that particular style because it felt right to him and it felt kind of real. And it also allowed the actors to move within the space. And then we evolved that on You Won't Be Alone. But he, you know, in our first meeting, he was like, you know, I normally shoot one, three, three. I don't know if they're going to allow me to do that on my first film. So I'm presenting like one, four, four. <laughs> I was like, okay, so it's a little bit wider. It's more traditionally, or 143 is like IMAX. So, you know, and once again, like I kind of knew because he wanted to be isolated with the characters and to be in there with the person. And, you know, then we started exploring ideas within that 144 ratio to try and place them on the bottom of frame or the edge of frame and seeing how that kind of felt. Um, and you know, we just did our recent film again. Uh, we did, we did a second film together and that was on one, three, three. So we kind of go mm -hmm. on back to that a little. And what is his philosophy? Does he just like the height of the frame for working with talent or like the characters? Yeah. Work with talent, work with faces, mm -hmm. being in there with our characters. You know, he likes to be quite close. Um, yeah, he likes to be like right in there with our characters. Uh, I think it's just the format that he kind of like really mm -hmm. embraces and a lot of his films that he loves are from uh, the shot like one, three, three. Um, and when you're building these projects out, whether it's blue Bayou, the Kenzo piece, mm -hmm. do you solely just look to films? Like what inspires you as a, as a cinematographer? Do you like looking at photography, specific art? Definitely photography. Um, I try not to reference too many other films. Obviously, mm -hmm. you're going to be referenced. Mm -hmm. And obviously, you know, like a lot of people who they see You Won't Be Alone, they're like, oh, it's super referenced by Malik. Yeah, I didn't even Which, want to see. <laughs> look, I, I understand. And to be honest, it, it didn't really help that going had two pieces of music. But, you know, it was always written. And, you know, like, we're like, oh, we kind of like the idea of that. But as Goran mentioned, it was like, no, I, of course I'm referenced. Uh, influenced by Malik, but I'm also is equally referenced by Jane Campion or it also Andre felt Arnold or like very Bellatar as well at certain Bellatar time. Tarkovsky, mm -hmm. um, you know the fact that it did have the voiceover constantly, but that was like the character. Like when we're filming, like I'm not thinking about too much of what the voiceover is, so we kind of forgot until we saw the edit. And we're like, oh wow, it is really like Tarkovsky, but uh, sorry, uh, like Malik, and you know like. It's definitely like you can kind of see that, but 
once again, like I do feel like we did our own stamp on it and we were shooting on longer lenses, 40 or 75. We did shoot on the 144 kind of ratio. Like we were very more internalized with our characters. And, you know, Malik recently and Chiba have gone like, super wide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A 10 mil or a 12 mil, you know, whatever. Yeah. So I feel like stylistically there are differences, but I can see the influence, you know. And, you know, obviously we are influenced by what we do love when it comes to cinema. Wang Kai Wai is a big influence as well. Um, and you can see that in Blue Bayou quite a lot. You know, and even Kenzo to some extent. But it wasn't really like we... Sometimes we would watch stuff just to see, like, Blue Bayou, I guess we watched a lot of films in the 70s and just like... You know, we'll discuss it, but it wasn't anything like, oh, yeah, we're going to use that particular shot or that bit. You know, it's more generally, I guess, feeling. You know, You Won't Be Alone. You know, Garin mentioned films by Lucretia Martel. This film called Trio Wooden Clogs. Uh, yeah, it's a great movie. Andre, yeah, like, he was really interested in, like, the peasant world. You know, and then mm-hmm. I personally, I watched... Two films, uh, Weathering Heights by Andrea Arnold, shot by Robbie Ryan, um, and that Polish film, uh, Ida, Ida? Yeah, by uh, Paolo Pilowski. Yeah. yeah. Um, that was nominated, I think, for yeah. the Academy Award. So I watched well, Weathering Heights more for Robbie Ryan because, and then Andrea Arnold because I don't know they always have a handheld camera and they're in a very similar environment to ours. It's period. So I just want to like, see what they were doing it's just hit the, her camera and the way Robbie does it is so subjective I was like okay can you watch a whole film that's handheld in that kind of particular way and you can't and they still had the emotions so I was like okay cool they've done it and it's been successful without it being too uh, too stylistic or, you know so I'm like, okay, I have the courage to be able to do uh, like a film predominantly handheld on long lenses. You know, normally when people do handheld, they go for like slightly wider lenses because it smooths it out a little mm-hmm. bit. And But knowing that, you know, starting to get an idea of what go on light, I'm like, okay, can I go there and for it still be a film that involves you emotionally as opposed to like distracted by the shakiness or whatever. And then Ida was, because I knew, you know, that was a very composed film. Yeah. Black and white, like beautifully. Masterclass in composition. It, that and then be. that's, there was, the composition in that was quite unconventional. So I was looking at that thinking, oh, wow, you know, like they've really gone quite, they've been quite daring in their composition. You know, it's a locked off camera. Can I do that in our film? Because ours is handheld or a bit more fluid, would that still work, you know? So I was, those are the questions I'm asking and being inspired by what they did, it was like having the courage to be able to go, oh, okay. You know, they've gone there to one extent. Now, can I do that? At least be like inspired by um, them not, uh, yeah, them being daring. And then if I could, Take on and make it work for this particular film, because you know I, Goran like and Justin like you know they're up for unconventional things as long as there's a reason or a feeling behind it. You know, with you and be alone like when she comes out of the cave, like Goran's like, you know, she's never been outside. So I'm like, Goran's like, I kind of want the feeling where she feels like the sky is swallowing her. I was like, okay, how do we do that? And then goes, I don't know, man. Like, what if you like turn the camera on its side? <laughs> and then I'm like, oh, okay. Let's try that out. And then we did this thing where we came from the sky and came down on her with the camera tilted. You know, I I can't even quite see what I'm doing because <laughs> the monitor's on its side. But seeing it in the film, it's like, oh wow, like that actually kind of works. You know, you never know. It was, it was something's really going to work, but you have to give it a try. And, you know, the fact that we went slow and what Goran did with the music, you know, I feel like, yeah, I feel like that worked and it wasn't, you know, it's definitely a bold choice, but it wasn't, um, 
yeah, yeah, it was in line with what he was looking for mm -hmm. um, uh, emotionally. Yeah, I mean, both films immaculately composed, really good yeah. sense of composition. And something that I loved, especially with You Won't Be Alone, was how we were talking about a little bit earlier is the way the camera just followed people, mm -hmm. but it was always present. Mm -hmm. It always felt very in the moment. Mm -hmm. And sometimes we'll see movies that try to emulate maybe a certain, like a similar uh, ex execution style. It just, there's like a lack of intention. Mm -hmm. And I think you said mm -hmm. that best is there always felt like there was an intention for at least the camera to be there in that moment. Mm -hmm. And I think that goes to the writing too of Gorin and course, just putting yeah. the piece together. It's it, like you could say, even with Malik, sometimes you're like, okay, why is this here? Like, why is this happening? Yeah. And I love Malik. Malik's one of my favorite filmmakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But with this film, they're always sent, like, I always felt that, all right, the writing was providing mm -hmm. a reason for all of this to be happening. Mm -hmm. And that's why anyone that's like, hasn't seen this movie yet, 100% go see it. Because it is worth it alone, especially on the big screen. Is it still out in theaters right now? Uh maybe in a couple of cities but yeah yeah no longer in la and yeah mm -hmm. and what are some of uh and we'll speak we'll stick to you won't be alone mm -hmm. what were some of the challenges and ultimately like lessons that you learned from that film that you're carrying on to your next projects i think with you won't be alone in particular we're shooting in a way with the actors that was quite freeing and the actors numi sarah uh uh uh, uh, Anna Maria, mm -hmm. you know, they're incredible actors. And for them to see what we're doing and being part of it, they could feel it as well. So they'll be like, oh, wow, like I've never really been allowed to perform in this kind of particular way before. So for them to, for them to see that, and obviously Numi's incredible and... Yeah, she, you know, her performance was uh, tremendous. It was awesome. Uh, uh, Anna Maria, she's in the suit, like she's in this full body. So I was like, oh, hopefully we can, you know, like, and she's incredible because you can feel what she's, what she's doing and feeling, you know, in, in a full body suit. And to be able to allow the actors to do that. And like I said, everything that we, we may like with the creative choices, you know, we tried to keep the mechanics away. Mm -hmm. And because of that, it frees up a lot of newer, um, it's like an approach that's a bit more spontaneous and instinctual, but it, it needs everyone to be involved in that. I can't do that type of filmmaking. I mean, you know, n not a lot of films, like it, it can't be for every film and but the films that I guess Gohan has done and, you know, and Justin, for example, you know, it allows us to be able to push in a certain way. And, you know, like it's a period film and we want people to be involved in it. So that's something that we've kind of been drawn towards. Um, and once again, like to not be, you know, like sometimes shooting that film, I was like, I wish I was on a dolly. I wish I was in a studio. I can control the lighting. I can control the sun. You know, like I wish I could do that. But we embraced, you know, we were shooting in Serbia in winter. So in the mornings, it'll be freezing cold and there's fog, but then there's full sun. So like, I'm like, oh man, like my gaff is looking out to the sky. I'm sorry, man. We have full sun now. But because we had scouted and we knew the sun path, you know, we always kind of scheduled so the light was fairly backlit. And with the Cooks being Pancros, you know, it kind of like started flaring in a certain particular way that kind of looked interesting. And like I said, I was moving the camera in relation to where the light was at the particular time and to where the actors were. And I don't know, just, it just started like, if I planned it out and designed, oh, this is the ideal situation, that was not it. But that was what was given to us. And because our schedule is so tight, like we just made it work. But it also has a certain feeling to it. And we, we embrace what was given to us. And the film, I think, has a certain distinctive feel to it, you know? Like if it was all overcast, I think it would have a different feel. And that's kind of what I was thinking it would be because we're shooting winter. But no, it just gave us something that was kind of like unique to that time. You know, there was a scene where where she's as a man, you know, they're burning like 
uh, corn or leaves or what you know they're burning stuff it's a big bonfire and then Maria comes and it's like full sunlight and because there's so much smoke everything's kind of like you know it was really lit like the smoke was really really bright but it had a certain feel to it and when you expose it for the smoke then the it had like a uh, out of this world kind of feeling and you know like I said we just embraced that and in, in the film it's just like oh okay if I had you know if I was going to light that I might not have gone in that direction but we kind of made it its own thing and embraced that so I think it's like have like being able to be spontaneous and being able to go with your gut instinct I think is the big thing coming out of you won't be alone and that's something that you know maybe we could take that into like a bigger series or a bigger budget you know mm-hmm. still have that mentality but to build on that uh, I guess outlook and point of view to, yeah that's awesome the point of view I guess yeah yeah no that's really good that's very amazing insight and um, something I love to ask all of our, all of our guests, mm-hmm. you know, as a working professional, how mm-hmm. do you stay fresh and inspired with such a busy schedule? Do you have any like hobbies or anything that you like to do outside of filmmaking? It's a very good question. I think lately, you know, I've been very fortunate. It's like the films I've been doing have been uh, like one in Serbia, one in Melbourne, uh, New Orleans. Uh, Europe I've been able to be able to travel so for me being a part of that being able to travel is part of why I love what I do I like, to get to meet and work very closely with crew from around the world you know some of them they, uh, English is not always uh, you know they're not always versed great in English but we still speak the same language when it comes to filmmaking Mm -hmm. that filmmaking language you know like if I say I need a negative here or you know they kind of know by the the body language so Mm -hmm. to say oh yeah you know I I know kind of what you know so that for me is like I love that aspect of it and then when I'm not working I'm kind of just pacing myself you know I try to take things easy because I know when I do go on a project it's like intense um yeah emotionally physically like it's like a ride and then it's always going to be a challenge filmmaking is always going to be challenging sometimes you're like when you're not working on film so you're like i can't wait to get back i can't wait to you know feel like i'm pushed and challenged but then when you're in it you're like oh i have to wake up at 3 a.m now like i have to go trek on this mountainside and it's freezing cold and you know it's like torturous you're like oh you have to remind yourself why are you doing it? And obviously, that's the uh, when you're filming, when the camera is rolling, and then you're in it, and then you're like, okay, cool, we got that. Say now, it's so the next. You know, it's like quite daunting when you think about it like that. But it's like piece by piece, and you start building that. So you know, when I'm not filming, I'm kind of like just chilling out. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, just not try try to think too much and just sure. watch stuff or you know photography here and there, but or just see people I haven't seen. Because I know when the filmmaking comes, when that next <laughs> filming adventure is like, it's, it's going to get busy. It's going to be painful. Absolutely. And then, you know, I you, know, you give you so much of yourself to it that you're like, oh, okay, I need to like balance everything out, else out, outside of that. No, that's amazing <laughs> advice. And that's something this will be, you know, to wrap it up right here. What is some advice that you would give a younger filmmaker that's starting out or someone that's about to go on their first feature? I think to really be open, open to uh, not to have two things like preconceived or to be open to try new things or to be open to make mistakes, maybe not on first film, but in filmmaking in general, or to be open to try things that scare you. Um, you know, there's like a lot of us kind of like have you know, we all have self-doubts about a lot of things. But it's also having the confidence in yourself or to build that confidence by 
oh, okay, I, I, I've kind of done that before, but maybe this, you know, to really listen to your instincts. And a lot of times my instincts, it's contradictory or, you know, like a lot of people run on fear and it could be controlling or to play it too safe. But if hopefully you're in a situation where you can be able to push that and a lot of the filmmakers I work with, especially Lily, Justin and Goran, I know they have a lot of self-doubt they don't always express it, but they have that self-doubt. And I'm there to be able to support them and to push them and say, no, 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 believe in what, you, what you're doing. And then vice versa, they have that in me. So we support, and you know, we've, the producers that we work with, uh, Christina Seaton, who was on You and Bill, and she's very supportive and she's very like, she can see the reasons why we're doing things. And it is unconventional, but we are pushing things and it's like the result of it is, like, oh, wow, this is something fresh. So to always keep pushing for the right reasons and to not be afraid and to not talk yourself out of anything. And, you know, you do need this. Filmmaking is a very collaborative thing, so you do need the support of a lot of people to be able to do that. Mm -hmm. up, until, up until like the uh, producers, the studios, whoever's financing, you know, like, I'm surprised that we got to make... I'm not surprised. I'm very fortunate to be part of it, but a big part of that is Goran and Christina to be able to say to Focus, this is the kind of film that we want to make and for mm -hmm. them to embrace the type of film and to allow the filmmakers to make it. Like, it's a crazy film about witches in Macedonia. <laughs> you know, like, right. I remember reading the script going, how is this film getting made? And hopefully we get to make it the way... Goran and Christina envisioned it and mm -hmm. you know they definitely stood by that and I was like I said I'm fortunate that I was able there to support them but also I wasn't there to talk them out of anything like whatever the ideas that we were heading towards I was in line with and supportive and tried to push that so you know like I said like a lot of people in this like I wouldn't say a lot but you hear these stories and it can be disheartening Sure. And I've been in those situations where it's been disheartening. And you're like, oh, okay, like this is not a great feeling. But, you know, then you start continuing away and you do find people that are collaborative and supportive. And you want to be able to support and give back. Um, so, yeah, hopefully, like, mm -hmm. you can align yourself with people like that and to be also supportive of people like that. And then, you know, doing what you guys are doing with these courses is like, continue to educate and continue to give, give back and um absolutely yeah, yeah i think it's very important what you guys are doing oh thank you um you know like there are times you know like i said like i do i watch a, uh this series and a lot, few other series and you know the team deacons like anytime anyone is willing to share their experiences and a lot of the times it's like oh wow like i've thought similar things or you know oh, okay, like they've gone against the grain there or they're not afraid to do that. And then hearing that or seeing that, it's confidence. Because, you know, I don't know if I'll, I don't know what I'm doing, but I've, like I said, I have to trust what I'm feeling. Um, and I think that's very important is always having a conversation. And Shane's been such a big proponent of that, of he's always taught about, you know, mm -hmm. there's a lack of mentorship right now. People mm -hmm. aren't sharing ideas and there's enough mm -hmm. work to go around for everyone. And this mm -hmm. idea that if you tell someone you're going to be out of a job is rather foolish because mm -hmm. that's how we make the art better, the medium mm -hmm. better. Mm -hmm. And I think that's really like very inspiring and wise words for everyone that's entering this craft to like one, trust your gut, but to also be vulnerable, you mm -hmm. know, the vulnerability of filmmaking and just being an artist in itself is truly where a mm -hmm. lot of the best ideas birth from. And I think your films ultimately have shown that, you know, you. so we really appreciate everything that you've done with these directors and obviously with your talents as a cinematographer and bringing these projects to life because the more movies like this, the merrier. I know that I'm a cinephile and based on everything that you've said, I love watching stuff like this. And we really appreciate the time just to like talk this through and, you know, give us your process. We think that's awesome. And in terms, just like close anything else, is there anything else you'd like to add? Oh, just that, I, yeah, like I said, thank you for having me on. 
Um, and once again, thank you for watching the films and uh, supporting the films. Because, you know, like I said, like, it's hard to make films. It's extremely hard to make films. And to make them with the way that I want to experience films and to stand by that and to be, you know, extremely proud of the work that I guess I've done, but also being in support of the filmmakers and the collaborators. Mm -hmm. You know, it's hard to make a film and anything worth doing is going to be extremely hard and challenging. So knowing that going in, like, yeah, I guess, yeah, very supportive of everyone who supports the films and, um, absolutely, like I'm uh, no doubt supported by a lot of other filmmakers and the work that you guys do and the work Shane has done and like keep growing this whole thing because, you know, like I definitely love what, what I do and the, the community and we all need to like support and to grow and mm -hmm. to challenge mm -hmm. because I think better work comes out of it. So Absolutely. And how can people keep up with you? Can they follow you on Instagram? Yeah, What's yeah. your handle? Uh, Matt Scope. And there's a website there. And yeah. Yeah. Everyone make sure my favorite project of yours, which I've already said it, is the Kenzo Yo My Saint. <laughs> like I am telling you, if you have not seen that, the poignancy of that piece, highly yes. recommended. Obviously blew by you and you won't be alone. But spend some time on his website. Check out his Instagram. It's dope. And anyway, there's a lot more to come. And I hope the next Goran film, if you want to come back to talk yeah, about we, it, we, we would love to have you. We All right, everyone, make sure to like and subscribe to the channel. That was another amazing Finding the Frame. And we'll see you next time, y'all.